Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Mingo Sanchez, and I'm a sales engineer at Tamer. I hope you're all staying healthy and safe. Tamer and Data Kitchen are thrilled to be putting on today's webinar, Data Ops and Analytics, a Recipe for Accelerating Business Value. In today's presentation, we'll be going over an introduction of what Data Ops is and why large organizations need it. After doing so, we'll go over some of the key benefits that organizations experience when they're using data ops and how to overcome some of those common challenges associated with these sorts of pipelines. And at the very end, we'll have some time for Q&A to ask our speakers some questions from the audience. So throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter those questions in the control panel through GoToWebinar, and we'll address those at the end. As a quick reminder, the session is being recorded. So afterwards, uh, if you want to access the recording, uh, a link will be sent out to all attendees. Our two speakers are from Tamer and Data Kitchen. And the first is Tamer's head of product, Mark Marinelli. Mark has over 20 years of experience in enterprise data management and analytics. And as a man of many hats, has held positions in engineering, product managing, and technology strategy. He previously worked at Lucian Technologies, Macrovision, and LavaStorm, where he was CTO. Our second speaker today is Chris Berg, CEO and head chef at Data Kitchen. Throughout his career, Chris has been a COO, CTO, VP, and Director of Engineering. As a co-author of the Data Ops Cookbook and the Data Ops Manifesto, Chris is an expert on data ops. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chris and Mark. All right, thanks everybody. This is, I'm gonna start off. So this is, this is Chris Berg speaking. So um, the, the first slide, it has a picture of a river and in some ways, at a 10,000 foot level, the data and analytics, and I'm gonna use those words to mean everything from data science to data engineering to, visual, to visualization. Um, we're not building houses anymore on 30 year mortgages. We're kind of delivering a river of value um, and a river of insight. And our customers in some ways subscribe to that river instead of buying a mortgage. And so they demand kind of an experience where they can get original insight that's sort of delivered fast, like overnight in, um, like Amazon does. And it's got to be really high quality. Um, people are very intolerant of errors. And of course, it's got to be low cost. And so that idea that analytics is a subscription experience as opposed to a 30 year mortgage on a house um, is, is not really being met very well because analytic teams are struggling to actually deliver on this subscription experience. Um, and there's a lot of statistics to back it up. Um, so Gartner has this statistic that, you know, 50 to 80% of all projects fail. Um, we've done a survey with Eckerson that most analytics have just a huge number of errors in. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of people are think that data and analytics is really important. And in surveys of CIOs, it ends up being, you know, some of the one, number one or number two things being invested in. Yet there's this challenge of why things aren't being, uh, you know, why things aren't being working. And so I guess the, the question for this webinar is given, you know, a subscription economy, should we be worried if our users are gonna cancel our subscription given there's a recession? And so um, so let that, let that be the front and let me keep going. So um, what we're gonna talk about here is sort of an introduction to, to data ops. And um, I'm gonna go through that. And so the first idea is almost a philosophical idea. So what you do, is much less important than how you do it. And so let me repeat that one more time. What you do is much less important than how you do it. So how does that apply to data and analytics? Well, let's first of all, think of it from a different perspective. Um, if you look at industrial manufacturing and, and Tesla, he talks, has this quote that the machine that makes the machine or the factory is more important and more complicated than the product. And uh, Dr. Deming, said when you have a problem, it's often not the person problem, it's not a special cause, it's the process around it. That's the, the thing that you should work on. And that's a, those are two aspects of what you do is, is much less important than how you do it. 
And so there's a lot of things that we do in data and analytics. We create a model, we, we choose an algorithm, we find a data feature, create a data pipeline, we train the model, we do data visualization, data governance, data engineering, even the data itself. And so the idea I think here is that how you do these things, the process of development, the process of deployment and monitoring and iterating and collaborating uh, is, uh, is very important. And so it's a really kind of contrarian idea that um, that we have here and that, uh, you know, if there's a huge industry, a hundred billion dollars devoted to um, kind of selling you tools to do things to do on top of your uh, algorithms and, and data features. And so I'm holding here, just trying to, there we go. And so, you know, the tools, the technology, the data are just not important as the people in the process. And so, you know, why is that? Um, and I think in a lot of ways, the data and analytics industry is kind of like the US auto industry in the 1970s. You know, we're making cars, we're making a lot of cars, um, but the process to actually build a new model for the car takes forever. Our, um, and the cars themselves have lots of bugs and they don't last very long. And so it's kind of slow to add new features. Um, it's we have a lot of errors in our dashboards. Um, model deployment is slow. And you know, if you worked in the a Ford factory in the 70s, you were unhappy. And I think a lot of data and analytic teams are, are, are struggling. And you know, the other challenge that data and analytic teams have is that their um, th their time is sort of not well spent. Um, you know, if you look at this graph that has a percentage of, of a, a team's time per week, um, you know, they're just spending too much time on, on kind of stuff that doesn't add value. They're not creating new features. They're not adding new data sets. There's just an, a lot of errors in operational tasks. And that's actually due to the complexity that we've created, the complex organizations and roles, the tool chains, the data, the collaboration across different teams. And you know, we're not the only one who agrees with this. We actually created this graphic um, a, a couple of years ago and Gartner re recently did a survey that, that sort of validates that people aren't spending the right amount of time on, on things that they, they should. They haven't, they're not innovating, they're just kind of making the, the trains work. And so, uh, you know, for many years I was a, you know, I've worked in software and then for about 10 years, I, I've, and, I, and I still do, I manage data engineers, data scientists, people who do analytics work. And, um, you know, as that in, in that previous role, I was pretty unhappy, to be honest, that I, mainly because my data providers who gave data didn't care that I existed. They would forget files and drop columns. And the data consumers were living in that subscription economy already. And they were constantly asking for innovation and, and pretty intolerant when I was me or my team were, were late. And um, it, it really actually sort of a, makes for kind of an emotional um, uh, beaten down and dist distraught team. And so also teams that just can't create and innovate. And so in some ways, uh, data ops is, uh, is, is more of a movement that try to sort of help teams reclaim control uh, of that situation. And the, from a definition standpoint, think of it as a set of technical practices and cultural norms and architecture patterns that really focus not on what you do, but how you do it and specifically how you experiment, the cycle time at which you can get things into your customer's hands. Um, and how can you actually do that in a way that has low errors and a way that can collaborate across all this complicated technology and, and people in all the different locations they are in the organization. And finally, uh, it also talks about measurement, which is really, can you measure these processes that you have in the organization? And so, you know, what are those processes? And so, um, I'm going to talk about three of them here. And so the first one is really the process that you do when you're um, running a factory, when you have something in production, it's accessing data sources, it goes through a bunch of, uh, think of it as manufacturing stations. And that could be from access to uh, ETL, to visualization, to data science, to MDM, to governance. Um, and you're assembling data, changing data, creating artifacts, and finally you're getting the result that your customer wants. And so one perspective is that this pipelines, this orchestrating data to customer value is, is uh, a very important process that you need to manage. And what happens in that process is there's just a lot of different great tools in each category and people love their tools. And 
I don't think I ever want to get into a discussion between, uh, you know, an argument between someone who loves R or Python or someone who loves Tableau versus Looker. They're all just, they're all great tools, uh, but it's the process that those tools live in and the factory is more important than um, the, the actual uh, tool that you happen to use in that factory. And then if we look at um, those pipelines themselves in production, they're kind of mapped into how organizations work because, um, you know, where data and analytics lives in a company is, is varied. You know, sometimes the IT team will own a data warehouse or a data enablement or a data lake. Sometimes there'll be a data science team who maybe just works for the CEO or some other part of the organization. And then there'll be self-service line of business teams using the, the own, uh, using their own tools. But at the end, at the very end is your customer. And that customer is, this uh, seeing the result of all these different teams working across all these different tools. Um, and sometimes there's not one sort of factory assembly line, but a lot. And so that um, is, I think, pretty common in big organizations. And then the other part is, uh, if you look at it, there's another process to deploy ideas um, from the fingers and the minds of your data scientist and data engineer and, and business analysts uh, from their fingers into the hands of their customers. And that's generally called the deployment process. And that's a lot like what software has done with continuous integration and deployment. And a, a data ops perspective is that, you know, think of partly what your team is as a software team, and you've got to handle that complexity and that code. And if you look at these two pipelines, the pipeline that's happening in production where data is coming in and you're producing value, maybe it's batch, maybe it's streaming, and another pipeline that you're actually deploying to production, these things have to almost have to happen at the same time, right? And, and you just don't want to have find out about data problems from your customer and, and you want to make it easy and fast to take ideas from your data scientist head and get into production. And those things are, are very, very opposite and very challenging to do together. Um, and there's a third pipeline here to think about um, is not just the process of, of running things in production or deploying to production. There's the, the environments that these things live in, the technical environment. And so uh, in a lot of organizations, the um, process to build these things is slow. How fast can you create a sandbox environment? Uh, how well, what's the difference between one environment and another? And so to think of these things as processes or pipelines that are important to invest in, important to manage, uh, and, and important to run and perfect is a perspective that data ops has. Um, and so um, I'm going to uh, change hands here and give, give it to Mark. Um, and so thank you very much and take it away, Mark. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so. I'm going to take us through a framework that we've developed at Tamer over the years that we've been doing data ops as part of our customers' uh, data management evolution, oftentimes a digital transformation initiative, um, but really holistically changing the way that they're working with data. And uh, so I'm going to take you through that, both um, the constituent parts of it and some advice on how to get started in that framework uh, at whatever degree of maturity you're already at. Um, but first, I'm just going to reframe the problem. Um, this is an exemplar of the type of headline that we see and, and don't like to see, wherein we are, um, we've probably hired a bunch of data scientists. There's now enough supply to meet with demand. We've got great ambitions of how we're going to apply data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning to evolve our business for competitive advantage, et cetera. And then the record scratch moment comes when we find that they cannot get their hands on enough high quality, accurate data to produce good, trustworthy, actionable outcomes from their work. And in so, to solve that problem, start, stop doing data science and start doing data engineering and end up having to go upstream and do a lot of the stuff that we didn't hire them to do just so that they can find decent data to work with. Um, so I, I think probably a lot of folks on this webinar can identify with areas where they've had projects that were lofty in their ambition, but were stifled initially um, by a lack of good quality data, ongoing data um, and, and what everybody needs to uh, to build something worthwhile. Um, if you look at the current challenge, how do we how do we change this? Um, how can we enable consumers of the data 
in the face of shifting requirements, they're always going to have new requirements, those, those analytical applications or machine learning or AI, the, the world's best customer churn model that we're coming up with is always going to have shifting requirements that are coming from those consumers. Um, without the analysts and data scientists who are doing all of that work actually having to spend their time on the data engineering that gets them the data that they need and knowing that we're going to have to do this as quickly as possible, rapidly delivering new, new value and new data in a scalable way using a ton of data, that's the point here, that changes all the time. That's just the reality of it. So that's, that's sort of a, a distillation of our current challenge the good news is that this is a pretty good analog to a challenge that we've already solved in software development. Just as data management practice is all about delivering the best high quality data as quickly as possible to the people who need it and satisfying those requirements, software is about delivering features with high velocity in ever changing requirements um, and also doing so more recently in, in cloud-based SaaS applications or even traditional data management applications with a large volume of data that are changing and new data arriving every, way, every day. So the way that software was able to solve this and lift developers into focusing all of their energy on developing against these requirements was a combination of, of the adoption of agile practices, but also the elevation of DevOps, development ops, as its own practice. So there was specialization in the supply chain, really, that was necessary to take these requirements, turn them into software, deliver them continuously and at scale. Um, so a lot of what we've learned from how we develop software is applicable in the way that we're developing data applications. And, and make no mistake, anybody who's doing data management right now, as I've described, it is developing applications. You're an application developer. So our framework as, oops, our framework as many, includes a combination of process, changing the way that you work, technology, choosing the right tools for the job, making sure that you're not just changing who and how is, is working on this and using technologies that weren't designed for it, but rather picking the best of breed technologies that are designed to facilitate this new way of working. And lastly, organization, um, what skill sets are brought to bear and how are the teams structured to do this work? So starting off with process, um, we're probably all pretty familiar with the waterfall methodology. I'm, I'm calling it the wrong way. Um, and the, the framework here we'll use in the ensuing slides is data on the left in a variety of different sources, a variety of different formats, and a variety of, of different levels of quality and trustworthiness, some of which is under your control and some of which is not because it's living outside of your four walls. And then your constituent consumers on the right who are building all of the aforementioned applications and have a variety of different needs and requirements from the data. Um, getting those data from the mess that it is on the, the left to all of the wonderful things we want to do with it on the right is where we come in. Um, the waterfall approach here, we have to take all of those data. We have to think of everything that we think everyone would ever want to do with those data. So I'm talking traditional enterprise data warehouse or master data management. We have to apply a model to those data. We take these data, we um, homogenize them and coalesce them around uh, format through normal form and, and figuring out all the relationships among the data. We codify a set of rules that apply all of the application logic that's necessary to cleanse the data, to change the format of the data for those downstream consumers. We do a bunch of testing to make sure all of this stuff works. And then finally, many months and potentially many millions of dollars down the road, data starts coming out. And at that point, these folks who need the data can start deriving value, there's your dollar signs, but also start reacting to it and asking questions and maybe even pointing out errors, often pointing out errors. So only at this 
crest of the waterfall are we now able to assess that we got something wrong far upstream now we need to go and fix it we need to change that data model potentially we need to retrofit those rules we need to do more testing we deliver it again hopefully we got it better um, this is enormously labor intensive there's a lot of people necessary to interview these consumers to codify their knowledge in these rule sets and and the data model itself um, there's a very IT driven process here um, and, and people will get it wrong. There's a translation issue sometimes in one of your consumers saying this about the data and then not being around when you actually have to go implement that rule and you make a guess and the wrong thing comes out the other end. Um, so taking a long time to deliver value not only compromises um, the, the length of time and the time to value of what we do, but can also people just leave these projects. It takes so long for them to derive value and they have to put so much into them that these uh, projects often go off the rails and, and fail. Uh, the majority of these projects fail. So the right way to do this is adhering to agile precepts here is to start small, smart, start with a subset of the data um, start with something that can actually deliver value, not the be all and end all. We know where we want to go, but, but starting off with a small subset of the problem of the data where we can deliver value, allow those users to then react to that, um, start, start deriving value from it, but, but interrogating it, asking questions, providing feedback about, about the quality of the, the models we've built, uh, the rule sets we built, et cetera. Then we build on that. Um, we do incremental delivery of value. Sometimes we get it wrong. There's another explanation point. We've, we've completely um, messed up this iteration of this. We've got to, we've got to stop and, and go back and, and try again. Um, but at least we are on a, on a biweekly or monthly basis getting some value out of the data, getting a lot more into uh, insight into how the data can be used. Um, and, and people will really give their time, less time, um, because we can automate so much of this um, over time. So then if, if, if we've all stipulated that we're going to work agilely, which I think most people in the modern era at least aspire to, then we've got to pick a set of tools that are going to get all that data from left to right. Um, the, the seven boxes that you see here represent the major components of a modern data ops, data supply chain. We need a catalog, optimally some way to crawl the data so that everyone who's using the data does not have to go down to the raw sources or know how those sources are, are formatted necessarily in their native form, but rather there's a one-stop shop where we can say, where is all the customer data in my entire organization? Who knows about it? How do I get my hands on it? Um, so that's catalog and crawling. Then we have to take these data and, and move them typically from those uh, raw sources into a lake or into um, some area where we're going to do analysis. To do that, we need some storage, we need some compute um, to build whatever applications we're going to use. And then we're going to apply the, the cornerstone here of mastering and quality treatment. We're going to uh, remove duplicates, we're going to enrich the data, enforce data quality validations, make sure that the, the data are adhering to how they should be and out the other end we're going to publish these out to those consuming users and applications in a simplified way so much different from having to go back to those raw sources or even the catalog um, but a nice distillation of here's a way to go find the best supplier data we have in the entire company here's a way to go find the best customer data we have in the entire company here's the current version here's what went into it and when new data arrive or something changes in our upstream processes here's a new version you should use this instead there's an outer loop to this that is one applying the correct or necessary data protection and governance policies to these data. We want to collaborate. We want uh, all of the people to get their hands on the data that they need, but we need to do so typically in compliance with some regulatory oversight or whatever our data um, stewardship and governance policies are. Um, so we need to make sure we do this responsibly. But the other loop is around gathering feedback from the consumers of those data, about the quality of those data, about the usage of those data, so that we can make the necessary upstream corrections in the source data or in any of the treatment that we're doing um, of those data. So that's, I think, have been 
underserved in really meeting the, the users where they're working with the data and getting lightweight feedback, asking them questions about the data. Is this right or wrong? Is this the most current version of this customer? And systematically being able to collect those data and do something about it. So these are the major components. Um, when you're going to go and, and pick out tools, and I haven't put a bunch of logos on the slide, as, as Chris said earlier, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these tools. There are going to be different ones that, that more befit your own needs, but in common, there are characteristics of these tools when we fill in all of those seven boxes on the prior slide that we wanna make sure um, we're, we're looking at. Um, one is, is scale out and distributed. Um, if you can build all this new stuff in the cloud, start there the economics are great the ability to have unlimited but temporary um, storage and compute for different types of workloads all of this stuff is wonderful and uh, we should get there as fast as we can a collaborative um, there's a there's a huge application here in everything that i've mentioned so far for machine learning and artificial intelligence as a way to automate a lot of the stare and compare or, or any sort of data quality or QC checks have been done on these applications as we're building it. Just like in a agile software development shop, you're going to offload a lot of your testing to automated tools that are going to be able to um, remove the necessity of traditional QA of, of manual testing. Um, Want to make sure that this stuff is open. If I'm going to go and pick the right tools, they should be best of breed, but they need to work with each other. So I need to avoid tools that have proprietary formats or proprietary ways of doing things. Everything should be exposed via APIs and I can mix and match and, and do the orchestration among them. Um, things need to be built for continuous processing. The data never stop arriving, um, they, they never stay in uh, one shape. Um, so we need to accommodate um, batch and streaming workloads and just from the beginning know that things are going to um, change often. And lineage and provenance should be embedded in all of these tools. For everybody on the right side of the screen to really trust the stuff that's coming out, they need to know oftentimes where it came from, who weighed in on it, um, and be able to perform forensics if some of the stuff is incorrect and know who to talk to and what data sets to consult as they have to do any remedial action. The other side of the, the tooling here is infrastructure. So being able to, and it's wonderful now, the, the three major cloud vendors and then the, the traditional on-prem vendors um, have big data solutions, um, you know, some variant of the old Hadoop stack. Um, so you can, you can use EMR and AWS or, or Google Cloud's GCP um, or uh, Microsoft's Azure or something like uh, Hortonworks or um, Cloudera. Um, there's plenty of these tools packaged up nicely for you um, to do this sort of infinite scale out. Then who does the work? Um, we've, we've organized this in three major categories. Now there are some people in your organization who are already doing this work and do not have any of these titles, but being deliberate about a separation of concerns and specialization within the different roles that are necessary to get the data from left to right is really important, especially as you scale out. You, you want someone to really think of themselves as a dedicated curator of the data, for example, and that they live and die by making sure that the people on the right side of the screen get the data they need, um, the right data. You want someone to be specialized in data engineering. Let those data scientists go off and be scientists. Let the data engineers focus their energies on data engineering. So these data suppliers are really your traditional owners of the systems. They need to be consulted when we're going to build anything. Um, they are typically represented at the executive level by a CIO. The, the data consumers on the right side of the screen, that's any set of users who want to build some you know, analytical application or operational application. They're going to be represented uh, by the, the chief marketing officer, chief financial officer at the executive level. And this, this new class of users with the elevation of the CDO, chief data officer, or the chief analytics officer at the executive level is representing this, this new group that is dedicating themselves to, to doing data engineering curatorship and, and stewardship, the uh, governance of these data. 
said you've already got some people probably walking the halls that do some of this work. Um, how do you find them? A good way is to look at what tools they're using right now um, and, and what you intend for them to use going forward. So a bit of an eye chart here, you could read it in, in posterity, um, but being deliberate about, again, these separations of duties and nominating people within the teams to at least perform this role initially, and then eventually to have this as their, their position in the, the whole supply chain. Structuring these things, there's a couple of uh, ways to bring these applications to light. Line of business wants to stand up a new application and they, they need a whole raft of data that, that haven't been um, prepared for them before. We can do the shared services model on the right where we've, um, we've stood up all of the aforementioned uh, tooling and people and you just come to us with your problem and we solve it and out comes data. And we, we work with each one of those teams intimately to make sure that we're iterating and, and getting the right stuff out to them. Um, there's also an advisory model wherein you're going to select the tools or, or select the right tools for whatever this application is, and you may provide some oversight in how these applications are built, but you're actually not taking on the entire um, competency of building all of these apps yourself. Those are for other teams within IT or maybe even the line of business themselves. Um, so depending on where you are in um, the maturity of your organization, depending on um, where, where your budgetary um, allocation is, the shared services model or the advisory model, each have their advantages and disadvantages, and you may kind of fluctuate between the two. Um, but these are the, the two major models that we've seen. So people, process, uh, technology, are, uh, I've given a, a layout of how to go find the right people, how to um, find the right tools, uh, or at least what those tools need to be, and how to apply them under the, the rubric of an agile development cycle. Now, how do you get started? Process. Um, agile is key. I uh, can't say that enough. Um, absolutely choose a model that works for you. Um, maybe you're already doing Scrum or Scaled Agile is, is nice and, and larger more complex um, organizations, um, but choose a model that works. Make sure that you don't try to entirely contort your business to fit the model, but rather you contort the model to fit your business. Um, people can get pretty religious about Agile and that, that can only um, end up with inefficiencies. Um, Agile, put Agile to work for you. Um, the way that, that best befits your business. Um, then go out and look at the set of available projects. There's um, everybody out there has a hobby horse in every line of business operation and score them on not just the value to the business of solving the problem. That's that's the obvious one, but also the availability of the data. Um, it, it is better to solve the third most important problem in the business that you can start solving next week because you have access to the people and the data and you're not subject to you know, PII considerations or something like that. It's better to solve that third most important problem in a couple of months than to solve the most important problem 18 months from now. Um, so it's really important to find a good balance between accessibility of the relevant data and people and the value of the problem so you can put your um, first points on the board. And that's that's defining that like high value data rich project that is actually gonna be hard to solve, but is going to be um, a, a, that right combination of accessibility and, and value that it can be solved relatively quickly. And this is going to be the exemplar now when you can show to the rest of the organization, we solved this really hard problem. We did it in a 10th of the time with half the people that we normally would. Who wants to apply this to their problem going forward? Technology. Um, you'd want to find your your end state. Um, we're, we're not gonna get there immediately. We don't want to uh, boil the ocean here, um, but think of that, uh, like I showed you those seven boxes, what those tools are gonna look like, how they're gonna interoperate, how you're gonna apply orchestration, and the overarching um, blueprint for your data um, management landscape. And then we figure out how we're going to increment there. Um, look at the current tools that are available in the current systems, figuring out which one can be replaced, immediately, which one has a lot of stickiness and can't be replaced. So we know a, a rough order from a um, systematic point of view where we're going to be able to start taking advantage of new tooling. Um, wrap some of these legacy tools in 
APIs so that they're emulating how those tools or those uh, components are going to work in the future state in that interoperable, nice free flow exchange of data via APIs. But you can wrap some of these um, monolithic or um, legacy systems in those APIs, keep them right where they are, but abstract yourself enough from them so that eventually when you rip them out, everything else doesn't have to change. Um, and then start with low touch, high value proof of concepts to evaluate the new technologies as you're looking at replacing some of those old technologies. Then getting started at the organizational level, um, finding who you've got, and mapping them to those areas of specialty. Um, you really want to make sure that your data engineers are um, identified and, and minted to specialize in data engineering. Again, trying to um, put a bulwark between the consumers and, and scientists and uh, data scientists and analysts um, from actually having to do any of the data engineering work. They're going to work very closely together, um, but, but there is a real advantage in specialization there. Um, find people who will be able to fill the, the newer specializations of data curation and data stewardship. Again, data curation is responsible for getting people the data that they need in the formats that they need it. Data stewards are responsible for making sure that uh, we are collecting all of the necessary feedback about those data and their consumption and we're fixing the data um, or applying uh, governance policies to make sure that the data are being used responsibly. Then you create a quick cross-functional team for one of those first projects that, that has at least these four uh, capabilities. That might be two people wearing four different hats. Um, it may be more than that um, in the beginning. Then choose your operating model. Start with that shared services. You, you take this on all by yourself for this original project um, and, and make it your problem and, and provide a nice um, layer of abstraction from the line of business so that they can just show up with their requirements and you can give them outputs and, and start with shared services. You may evolve that over time and make sure that you've got the proper air cover that the chief data officer or the C IO or CIO or whomever is overarching, has overarching responsibility for the success of leveraging the company's data and, and also has the authority to make sure that they can marshal the right forces to get this stuff done um, without their buy-in and oversight. This, this is going to go nowhere. So that's that's my take on um, both the framework and how to get started. I'll hand over to Chris, who's going to dig in a little bit on um, their view on on where to get started as well. Thanks, Mark. So let, let me give a case study on and where people start because I imagine everyone here works for a, a largest size company. They've already got analytics in production, and perhaps the the reason they're here is they've seen some of these business constraints that 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 drive people towards wanting to take a data ops approach. You know, perhaps you've seen a lot of errors in, in, in your dashboards or reports. Um, I was talking to a large multinational company um, just this morning and they, they count that they have over 250 problems a month in their production analytics. Maybe that's the one constraint that you'd like to solve. Um, there's plenty of companies who um, will take months to deploy 10 lines of SQL or a new predictive model from their development environment and production. Perhaps that's the business constraint you want to focus on deployment. Um, a lot of organizations are have poor collaboration either between a data engineer and a data scientist or between the people who work in a centralized function and a decentralized function, you know, the hub and spoke model. Or perhaps you're a uh, chief data officer just wants to get um, analytic about the work their analytic team is doing. And so these different constraints have are ways to focus what you can actually affect with data ops. And so I'm going to tell a story about how what what one company did to do that. And so if you look at these as constraints, you can then work and uh, think of, I want to fix this constraint. I want to fix this bottleneck. And this is actually not uh, uh, an idea that goes way back you know, 50, 70 years to manufacturing. And there's a thing called the theory of constraints. And there's a book called The Goal uh, written in the 80s. There's also a book called The Phoenix Project or The Unicorn Project that talks about pick a constraint, fix it, find the, the constraint or bottleneck that has, you know, the biggest impact, fix it, and then keep going. And you keep hearing this term iteration and iteration or cycles, I think are really important. And not only the cycle at which, um, 
you know, don't start off trying to do everything. Pick one thing, fix it, and iterate and improve. And I think that goes for your analytics. It also goes to how you implement data ops. And so if we look at this, you know, this customer who had too many errors, they're a, you know, a large uh, multinational transportation company. And if you look at their architecture, um, it's it's really cool in some ways. Uh, it's got you know data customers on the data sources on the left, uh, customers on the right. You know some other things are actual transportation uh, um, items that are streaming data. Some are systems that are like their ERP system that are more batch. They've got different tech tools. They've got Kafka and NiFi. They've got an enterprise service bus. They've got Informatica, and so they've got all these sort of ways that data gets into the system. And then they've got a big data warehouse and they use notebooks and Tableau and it's on-prem. And then they're also like a lot of companies experimenting and having part of their work done in the cloud. And so at the end of the day, their customers, the people, the business people who are using that data are upset because they're getting errors. Things are late and they don't know where the error is. Is the error in the actual machine that produced the data? Is the error in something in the, in the Kafka part? Is it in the Informatica part? Did something go wrong in, in Oracle? Or is it the if then else I put in my Tableau workbook? And so this complex error prone environment also goes into a organizational structure that runs it. And there's different teams that run these different tools. Um, they work in different parts of the organization. There's IT teams and data warehouse teams and data science teams and cloud teams. And so there's this complex ownership. So one of the things that, that we say is how do you prove to yourself that things are going to work bef um, before your customer sees it? So don't hope that things are gonna work. Don't hope your source data is right, actually prove it. And so um, what we did is actually develop uh, in our software a thing called a recipe. And that recipe sits sort of lightly on top of all these tools and technologies and kind of monitors and observes not only the systems, are they up and down, but actually the data itself. And so um, that way you can tell if, for instance, a, um, a, a field is wrong or the data itself is incorrect or some processing that happens on the data. And there's techniques that actually come from manufacturing called statistical process control that you can actually look in, and see. You can actually dig into the data and build rules that say um, this data is right or not. Follow the bouncing ball on the data as it goes across systems. But the whole idea here is, is hope is not a strategy. Don't hope your data, your complicated and data and analytic systems work and then work nights and weekends to try and fix it. That's just, a, you don't need to carry that hair shirt in data and analytics. You can change it. You can develop software that actually goes in and, and works and tests, and you can prove to yourself that before your customer sees the data, it's right. And so if you do that, it's actually focused on errors, then you can actually start alerting when things go wrong. So if one of those data providers drops a data file that they should, you can then get an alert. And then that alert can actually have you call that data provider and say, what the heck's going on? Um, and those alerts can be delivered in, in different ways. But if you start thinking of this like a factory instead of um, that, that you can own and improve, and you think of building an operational system um, and working on that factory itself, I think you can then uh, work to drive errors down. And the benefit of the, the driving the errors is that you end up having more customer data trust. And actually your team ends up having more time to innovate because they're not running around on nights or weekends uh, trying to fix things and they've got more time and more trust and they don't live in fear of something breaking. Because a lot of times people develop these complicated analytical systems and no one wants to touch them because no one understands them and, um, and you're just afraid to break them. And so, so we've talked a lot about um, a data ops in general. And so I showed these two graphs at the beginning. And you know, one of the things that we all wanna do as a data scientist or data engineer, we're involved in trying to solve customer problems. We wanna do new things and cool things. And so we just don't spend enough time on that. And, and it's because of this sort of Pro, the, the type of complicated, multi-tool, multi-data set, multi-people technology environment that we're stuck with these errors and operational tasks. We're having too many meetings, too much process um, to be able to get that done. And so what we'd like um, to do with data ops is to be able to change that equation so you can spend more time doing new innovative things. You can try out a new tool. Um, and less time having to, you know, get up on Saturday morning because a data provider had, you know, forgot to load a file and now your CEO is yelling at you and you've got to go figure out and fix it. 
And if you've been in the data field, everyone knows that situation. And so I think um, by focusing on error reduction, you actually improve your ability to innovate. And, and likewise, focusing on deployment latency, how fast can you get something from you know, the idea in your head into production? Uh, can you do that in hours or minutes instead of weeks or months? There's a, a side benefit of that as you learn more as an organization, you get that feedback quicker. And so there's a something I've learned over the years is just to be very uh, humble about what I um, about what I think my customers want. And it's much better to get something that's 70% right in their hands sooner and get feedback than to spend all that time getting what you think is 100% right, only to find out that it's wrong. So uh, focusing on the cycle time, the deployment latency, focusing on counting your errors, and actually focusing on your team. I think that they, they can, uh, on your team happiness, and uh, I think our, our benefits of adopting um, both our software and a, and a data ops approach. And so um, I'm gonna switch back to Mark, but uh, thank you much. Thanks, Chris. Um, so we're going to have time for Q&A, but uh, a parting shot here. Um, we've talked quite a bit about process and people and tooling and the skill sets and the, the tool sets that are necessary to make this stuff work. But there's also an overarching sort of mindset shift um, and, and kind of abandoning some of the, the ways that we've gone off the rails before. Um, one of them is just that you, you can't boil the ocean up front, that having a uh, a priori understanding of how everybody's going to use all of the data and all of its nuance and what all the data are going to be and, and trying to corral all of that from the beginning, um, not going to work. You have to have a long view and know where you're going um, with your platform and with your vision for leveraging your data. But it's really all about quick hit, quick wins, and then incremental improvement over time to, to get there. Um, a single platform is not going to solve your problem. Those different boxes that I brought up, the different constituent components uh, that provide functionality in the modern data engineering supply chain um, are best of breed. Choose the best of each one of them that befits your own needs. And you're going to do more work if you build the infrastructure to pull them all together to orchestrate and to um, you know make them play well together, but they're designed to play well together, to be interoperable. Um, so taking on that work in, in, as opposed to a single vendor or a single platform has a bit more upfront cost, but there's enormous benefit in the optionality that that gives you down the line. When somebody comes up with a ba better data quality solution than you're using now, or somebody comes up with a better data catalog, it's a lot easier to swap out their catalog for the uh, swap out your old catalog for their catalog because you've had this nice layer of abstraction um, between and the loose coupling between all of these tools so you're not beholden to one vendor's platform or their roadmap for the next five years um, and and that's part of the you know the problem we're trying to solve here um, if you're going to use open source um, of which there are a raft of tools that are immensely capable um, just don't understand, uh, uh, don't underestimate the effort of doing that work. Um, there's a reason why companies um, like Red Hat or, or Cloudera were so successful in being able to package this stuff and provide the services and and training and, and a, a complementary material that allowed it, made it easier to use open source. Um, so caveats there if you're going to take it on and, and make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, and then the last thing is is people. Um, a lot of the people who built these systems and who are um, part of the problem you're trying to solve are trying, hopefully, to be part of the solution. Um, but there's just behavioral stuff. There's there's data hoarding. There's the exposure of issues with the data by sharing the data, um, uh, imbuing your organization with a culture of data is immensely important, pretty hard to do, requires some sound leadership. Um, but, but really the, the principal thing that's going to drive that is adopting these new practices and putting points on the board, solving the problems a lot more quickly than you've been able to before. You know, new projects take, take a tenth of the time. The 
trust that people have in the data coming out of whatever you're building for them goes up um, over time people will um, will start to uh, there's a virtuous cycle there of increased trust and increased collaboration um, that'll make this work so with that um, I think we'll conclude and, and Chris and I can take some of the questions I think that have uh, been coming in in the chat now uh, Mingo I'll over to you to moderate that perfect well, thank you, Mark and Chris, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, just as a reminder, this uh, webinar is being recorded, and that recording and the presentation will be shared afterwards with all attendees. Uh, so no worries if you want to view this uh, material afterwards. And we'll do our best to address as many of these questions that have come in as we can uh, during the live session. But any questions that we don't have time to get to in the live session, we'll also follow up uh, with a written response to. So to start things off, a uh, pretty broad question. Organizations need to be able to trust their analytics. How can I make the case that agile data ops workflows produce better and more accurate results than traditional workflows, especially given that processes are updated so often with data ops? Sure, I'll take that one. Um, transparency, traceability are huge. I mean, first, get it right, um, and, and it's pretty easy for people to um, determine whether the data that you're giving them are accurate or not, um, and gather that feedback. Make sure that you have a really good instrumentation when people find that something is wrong, because in that first iteration, you, you didn't get it right, and there was a, a, a missing rule or a machine learning model that needed more training data or whatever, making sure that you have a, a systematic way to collect users feedback that's that's just as important as collecting uh, user feedback on a product in, in an agile uh, software environment getting that feedback um, doing something about it and then sharing the remediation of that feedback so people know that they actually have some agency over the improvement of their data quality will get a lot more buy-in um, and and the more more eyes on the problem the better You've already got a lot of people using the data. If you can get a lot of them actually uh, helping to improve the data by providing that feedback, that's huge. Um, and the other part of it is the, the transparency and, and visibility into where these data came from. Um, if, if people know exactly what was done to the data, where it, what sources were used, who weighed in on uh, why the data were shaped a certain way or, or certain metrics were derived analytically, um, that's really helpful as well so that they can have confidence that the right people worked on the problem and the right data were involved uh, and all the data were involved. That's another big one, making sure that um, as people start working with these data, if they say, oh, this would be so much more interesting if we had this other CRM database that we didn't use this time around. Um, all of those things, uh, I think, will contribute to, to people having um, more confidence that all of the data, all of the people that could possibly make this work are being involved. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so the next question, Chris, is for you. Uh, on one of your earlier slides about data catalog and governance, Wiki was listed as one of those types of data catalog sources. Can you expand on how you've witnessed the use of Wiki in this context? Yeah. So if you've got a running analytic system, and let's say you just want to add a data file, right? And so you've got to add a table. Um, maybe there's going to be a predictive model that has that table that's added in a database that's joined with another table. You're going to have a visualization. And finally, you're going to have to know what's in that table. And so um, what we try to think about in data ops is the flow of changes. And the flow of changes, the description of the data itself could be in a nice tool like a, a data catalog, or it could actually just be in a wiki that says in this in this table, here's the definition of here's the attributes of the table and here's where it comes from. And so, um, you know, for, from my standpoint, what we're, we're saying is it's really important that people understand where the data is and where it came from. Um, you know, we've got some customers who just happen to do that in, in a wiki and, and focus on um, making sure that it's right and making sure that the data catalog matches what's in the current database and making sure it's deployable and uh, as you would deploy uh, at the same time you deploy a schema change. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. So the next question uh, pertains to the current climate with everything going on in the world right now. So getting organizational buy-in for new projects is pretty tough. 
given everything that's going on today, organizations are trying to cut costs wherever they can. How can these organizations justify investing in new technologies to build data ops pipelines rather than doubling down and focusing on the tools they already have? Uh, I guess I can take that one because I just had a I had that conversation with a customer um, just yesterday, and yeah, you know I think that the reality is that automation uh, and removing work is something that everyone can believe in, and it, it, fundamentally, data ops is an is 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 an automation idea. Can I automate some of the the manual work and and some of the rework that's done in order for my team to be more efficient? And you know we've all had the great acronym life in AI and ML and well, big data is not an acronym, but like we've gone through this period of really uh, insane growth in the data and analytics industry. And I think it is time to, to work on yield and how well we can uh, do with what we have. Um, and I do think the idea of doing more with less is really fundamental to, to data ops. And I think it is a good, there is a good argument to uh, in a recessionary time to invest in improving the yield on what you, on what you, you have. Perfect, thanks, Chris. So another uh, follow-up question uh, is from the audience about how Tamer and Data Kitchen data ops offerings complement each other. So Mark and Chris, I'm sure you both can speak to this one. Sure, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I think they're very complementary in that um, you know Tamer is in the business of, of a central component in what I laid out of of mastering and and data quality and that feedback loop that I talked about. Um, but we we don't do it all. We need to be orchestrated alongside other tools that are complementary to us to subsume that entire you know data supply chain that I talked about. And Data Kitchen, with both their you know their expertise and their tooling, I see as um, a great outfit to bring all of these tools together and and solve the whole problem. Um, and Chris, you you may or may not agree with that, but but that's certainly the the tamer looking out. Uh, answer to that question. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree to that. And we're two T-stops away from each other, so that also helps. <laughs> Being close is definitely something that makes it easier. So another question uh, that relates to what's going on today in the world, how do data ops methodologies support remote work? Lots of organizations are being forced to adapt to a primarily remote, uh, remote workforce and may continue doing so in the near future. I've got one one on there. I, I'll, I'll flip it around and say not so much um, how did data ops support remote work, but how does remote work support data ops? Um, I think a really important aspect of having all of these teams work together and institutionalizing their knowledge and codifying it in, in tools is to capture all of that knowledge systematically. I, I kept talking about capturing feedback about the quality of the data. Um, if that stuff can no longer happen by grabbing somebody in the kitchen and saying, hey, I think your Salesforce report is broken because you don't have the Cleveland uh, customer base in it, but instead has to be captured somewhere in a system or on a wiki, um, which is what's going to happen now because we're probably not going to fire up Zooms to have those conversations. Um, all the better if if the way that people are having to work now um, and the tools that they're leveraging to collaborate lead to more knowledge capture um, and less stuff being trapped up in, in inboxes and hallway conversations, then um, you know all the stuff that we talked about is going to work better. Perfect, thanks, Mark. And I think we have time for one last question uh, before wrapping up. So one final question. If I have technical skills like database and programming skills, but no experience with data ops, how can I present myself to be a part of a company that follows these principles? Well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I think maybe I'll speak to it as an analogy. So when I used to manage software teams in 1999, there was someone called a release engineer. And that person, you know, we sort of threw our code over the wall to that release engineer and they were paid a little less than all us cool Java developers. And if you play that forward now 20 years, that release engineer is now called a DevOps engineer. And they're in fact paid in some cases more than the software engineers 
because the process of delivering things into production has become, and the cycle time at which you you do it has become so essential to the success of um, software development teams. And I think that pro that focus on cycle times and, and errors and the role that goes with it, the DevOps engineer role, I think is um yeah it's important. I think that's going to happen here, and it's already starting to happen in the world of data and analytics. The idea of a data ops engineer, and it is a way that you can take your sort of skills as uh, in, in database skills and, and try to transform them into focus less on I can make a database uh, work better, but more I can make the whole team be able to deploy faster with higher quality and in a more collaborative way. And I think um, that actually I'm very excited about the whole field of data ops because there's more companies being funded. In fact, there was just another one being funded just yesterday. Um, and uh, there's a lot of innovation going on in this whole field. And I think the, the perspective is that, um, and I think it's only gonna accelerate. And so I, I'm excited about the role of a data ops engineer and the possibilities for the future of, of, of data ops. Perfect, thank you so much, Chris. And thank you, Mark, as well. Uh, and thank you to all our attendees for joining this session today. I hope this was uh, interesting and insightful. Uh, we will be sending out the recording and the slides after the fact, as well as answering any questions that we didn't have time to address today during the live session. So thank you all again. Have a great rest of your day.